Kaplan oversight hearing on the Federal Communications Commission. Last week, a House Government Reform Subcommittee heard testimony from FCC Chairman William Kennard. Congressman Stephen Horn chaired the hour and 50-minute hearing. A uh, quorum being present, the Subcommittee on Government Management, Information and Technology will come to order. Today's hearing is the subcommittee's 90th hearing in this Congress, during which we've covered a wide range of issues. We successfully prodded executive branch departments and agencies to prepare their computers for Y2K. We highlighted government agencies' inability to balance their books, and we've examined the government's efforts to protect federal computers from malicious attacks. Today's hearing touches on all of those areas and more. We will examine management practices at the Federal Communications Commission. The Commission was established by the Communications Act of 1934. Since its inception, the FCC has been responsible for interstate communication systems from the early days of radio, then television, and now satellite and capable communications. The Commission oversees the licensing of approximately three million companies and station owners. Its five members are nominated by the President, confirmed by the Senate. To help ensure the nonpartisan role of this independent commission, no more than three members can be members of the same political party. In 1994, the FCC began auctioning off frequency spectrums. These auctions have brought $15.3 billion to the United States Treasury. Last year alone, the FCC collected more than $1 billion from the auctions. But as in most business propositions, the auction process has not been trouble-free. For example, five years ago, Next Wave Communications Incorporated won a bid gaining rights to the use of a spectrum, green to pay $4.7 billion for the airwave frequency. After making a down payment of $500 million, the company declared bankruptcy. That case was resulted in a protracted court battle. Delaying resale of the spectrum, which is now thought to be worth about $18 billion. We are interested in learning more about the extent of this type of problem. We want to examine the management practices and the challenges facing the Commission in the increasingly complex world of communications. I welcome our witnesses today. I look forward to your testimony, and I yield now to the gentleman from Texas, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, clearly, the FCC is a very important federal agency with very significant responsibilities that uh, deserve the oversight of the Congress. And in our effort and our carrying out our responsibility as a subcommittee uh, to give that oversight, we're here today to hear from the witnesses uh, before us. Uh, the FCC has as its primary goal, as I understand it, the promotion of competition and communication uh, protection of consumers and to support access for every American to the existing and the future communication services. The purpose of our hearing today is to be sure that the FCC has the necessary tools, the resources, and the management practices in place to accomplish those very important goals. So we're looking forward to hearing from each of our witnesses and I thank the chairman for uh, calling this hearing today uh, so that we might have the opportunity to carry out the responsibility we have of oversight of this, this agency. I thank the gentleman. And now uh, for the members, if you have not been uh, a presenter before us, this is an investigating committee. We do ask you to be sworn in. And we do have your very fine papers. And if you'd like to summarize, we would appreciate it uh, in, say, five, seven minutes. And uh, then what gives us more time for questions. So if you'll stand, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Clerk will note that the three presenters have affirmed the oath, and we now start with the first of them, W. Walker Feaster III, Inspector General, Federal Communications Commission. Mr. Feaster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the accomplishments of the FCC's Office of Inspector General and to share with you those activities that have aided the FCC's efforts to enhance its efficiency and effectiveness. It is especially rewarding to Inspector Generals when the Congress of the United States takes an interest in our continuing efforts to improve federal programs and operations. The FCC's Office of Inspector General was established in 1989 as a result of the amendments to the Inspector Generals Act of 1978. The office is staffed with nine people and has an annual budget of approximately $1.1 million. During my years as IG, my approach has been to focus on major issues of agency-wide significance. This approach has resulted in audits, investigations, and related activities in the areas of information technology, procurement and contract administration, financial management, and program management. In order to better familiarize you with our efforts, I will briefly review some of the more significant activities. In 1992, the Commission engaged in an agency-wide effort to modernize its automated systems. By 1994, the FCC had equipped all of its employees with personal computers and connected these computers internally via an intranet and to the world via the intranet. This effort served as a background of a system that has allowed the Commission to meet the challenges that must be faced on a day-to-day -day basis. The Commission also invested heavily in automated systems that permit its customers to interact with the Commission using computer technology. In response to this major commitment of resources, and as the Commission grew more dependent on automated systems technology, my office commenced work in selected critical areas. We initially focused on the physical and environmental security of computer systems. As our reliance on computers grew, our concern about the external security the network increased. In 1998, my office began working with individuals from Information Technology Center and the Commission's bureaus and offices to develop a systems development lifecycle model. This will give the Commission a, a standard model to use as it develops its computer systems in the future. My office has also done considerable audit work related to Y2K conversion. We provided the Chairman with independent assessments of the Commission's progress towards a successful conversion to the year 2000. In summary, my office has been an active participant in the Commission's evolution to technology-based organization. The Commission has made substantial progress in management and security of its computer systems. However, based upon the findings in the recently completed FY 1999 financial statement audit, Additional efforts must be undertaken to bring the Commission into full compliance with OMB Circular A-130 requirement for a comprehensive security plan. It also needs to accelerate its efforts to develop and test its computer contingency plans. Like many other agencies in the federal government, the FCC has expanded its use of contractors to meet the many needs in lieu of hiring additional staff. Since 1997, my office has been routinely conducting floor checks, selected voucher reviews, and incurred cost audits to monitor the Commission's administration of contract funds. It is my belief that the risk in this area have been significantly reduced through extensive efforts by the management and my office. In the mid-1990s, the FCC made a major commitment to improve its financial operations in the Commission. Recognizing this change, my office began to look at the critical components of the Commission's financial system. In 1998, we conduct, conducted a special review of the Commission's existing collection system. Of major significance in the Commission's commitment to improve its financial management has been the completion of a financial statement audit for 1999. The result of this audit was the issuance of a qualified opinion on the financial statement. This qualification involved property, plant, and equipment documentation and unfunded liabilities. I am quite pleased by the progress that the Commission is making in the area of financial management. While the efforts of my office have identified a significant number of issues that must be dealt with in the years and months ahead, it is my view that the Commission's commitment to improved operation in this area remains firm. My office will continue to monitor the implementation of our recommendations from various audits we have completed in the past. We are currently conducting an audit of the FY2000 financial statement and related reports to test the policies and procedures that have been put in place as a result of our recommendations. 
One of the statutory uh, functions of my office is to conduct and supervise audits and investigations related to program operations. During the fiscal year, we have increased the scope of our activities in the include, to include selected operating programs that will require additional oversight. We have currently three projects underway in this area. The first is a special review of the management of non-public information. The second is, a, is an audit of the operational effectiveness and efficiency of the Commission's National Consumer Center. And the third project is an audit of the FCC's performance as it seeks to fully address the requirements of the Government Performance and Results Acts. Act. Results of these activities uh, and audits will be available to Congress and the FCC management in FY 2001. Another major responsibility of an inspector general is to conduct investigations of alleged misconduct on the part of government employees, contractors, or other recipients of government funds. Over my years of IG, as IG, my office has been involved in a wide variety of allegations. Our caseload runs about 20 to 30 cases a year, and it has included, for example, employee theft of supplies, misuse of computer equipment, attorney misconduct in a proceeding, abuse of authority by senior officials, improper conduct by employees related to a contract award, and operating a business on government time and with government equipment. It is important to note that in all our inquiries and investigations, the rights of employees are fully protected. When conducting interviews, employees are given the appropriate legal warnings depending upon the situation. During the interview, they are permitted to be accompanied by a union official, a private attorney, or an individual of their choice. We also protect the information gained in the interview process to the fullest extent of the law. In closing, I'd like to th thank you for the opportunity to review the operations of my office with you. I believe that the Office of Inspector General has had a meaningful impact upon the operations of the Commission. We have met the challenge that you, the Congress, have set before us in the law that has established my office. My staff and I will work vigorously to build upon this foundation. I will be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now go to the second presenter, Adam Thier, research analyst, the Heritage Foundation. It sounds like we have a vote, but uh, let's proceed for at least five minutes, and then we'll just have to go and be in recess and vote, come back. Well, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of the committee, thank you for having me here today to testify on the urgent need for reform of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, I have worked on several projects related to FCC reform, both on my own at Heritage and with other public policy research organizations and academic experts in my 10 years at the Heritage Foundation. But I'll stress that my remarks here today are mine and mine alone and not those of the Heritage Foundation or any other organization. Let me begin with just a few brief words on why it is absolutely essential that Congress take steps to reform and downsize the Federal Communications Commission. And I'll begin with what I believe is a shocking paradox which is that we live in an age of deregulation, but the FCC is larger and more powerful than ever before. Mr. Chairman, as you know, Congress took important steps under the Telecommunications Act of 1996 to deregulate this important marketplace. Yet while companies in this industry have been forced to begin a demanding transition to a competitive market, nothing has been done to simultaneously ensure that the FCC reforms itself or downsizes in any serious way. In fact, FCC spending and staffing are at all-time highs. Uh, the FCC has requested total gross budget authority in fiscal year 2001 of almost $280 million and total staffing of 1,975 FTEs. By comparison, 10 years ago, FCC spending stood at $108 million and staffing was 1,734 FTEs. In other words, the FCC's budget has essentially doubled over the past decade and the agency has hired roughly an additional 250 bureaucrats over the same period. I should stress that this is a situation almost without precedent, both domestically and internationally. Domestically, when other important industries such as airlines and trucking were deregulated, the agencies which oversaw those industries were fo forced to downsize and in many cases were eliminated shortly after deregulation was pursued. This has not been the case with the FCC as telecom has been deregulated. On the international front, other countries pursuing telecom liberalization have tended to also greatly curtail or even end outright the meddling of their regulatory authorities within the affairs of industry. Again, this has not been the case with the FCC in America. Frankly, this situation is now becoming somewhat unbearable. There is simply no development within the telecommunications marketplace that is not scrutinized under the FCC's regulatory microscope. No major decision or development within this sector goes forward without the FCC somehow casting judgment on the matter. 
I would suggest that this sort of intrusive behavior is inconsistent with the intentions and framework that Congress set forward in the Telecom Act of 96. And while many FCC officials will claim that the bulk of their increased workload is, in, is because of the deregulatory activities they've pursued, one is forced to ask, does the FCC really need to take any steps to achieve deregulation? Why can't they just step aside and stop micromanaging the day-to-day -day affairs of this fast-paced sector? Congress should indeed reject this logic that some FCC, seems, FCC officials seem to put forward, that only they can make this marketplace competitive through their vigilant oversight and constant micromanagement of the affairs of this sector. The logical retort to that is simple. The FCC, if FCC oversight is so virtuous, then indeed why is it that the least regulated sectors, such as cellular phones and Internet services, are the most competitive and fastest growing? Moreover, when Congress downsized and abolished previous regulatory agencies, they did so precisely because they knew competition, real competition, would not blossom so long as companies could come to Washington and plead their case for special treatment with captured regulators. Real competition will develop only when companies stop competing within the beltway for the allegiance of regulators and start competing in the marketplace for the allegiance of consumers. This more than any other reason explains why there is such an absolute essential need for Congress to begin taking steps to reform and downsize the FCC soon. So what should Congress do to rectify this situation? A simple question deserves a simple answer. And I'll outline for you in closing a very reasonable and short and simple strategy to do so. Let's call it the cut and peel strategy. First, set some objectives. The cut part of this would be maybe three simple goals or objectives, such as say, first, a 30% reduction in funding, second, a 30% reduction in staffing, and third, perhaps the consolidation of the FCC's 16 existing bureaus and offices into, say, three streamlined divisions or units. And again, you should demand that these goals or objectives be achieved over the next three years. So with this sort of 30-30-3-3 framework in mind, you should then demand that the FCC achieve these objectives by shedding some of the responsibilities or redundant powers that they currently still enforce. This is the peel portion of the cut and peel strategy. I'll give you four specifics to close. One, spin off antitrust oversight functions to the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission, who already has the expertise and authority to do so, whereas the FCC does not. Secondly, transfer and consolidate all spectrum management authority and responsibilities within the NTIA within the Department of Commerce. Third, transfer international regulatory responsibilities to the Department of State or Department of Commerce, which are in a better position to deal with global trade and investment issues. And fourth, devolve universal service responsibilities to the state and local level who are in a better position to target assistance to those most in need. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, to conclude, may I be so bold as to suggest that this is not an unreasonable plan, especially viewed in light of the fact that the FCC has received a fairly lengthy reprieve from oversight and downsizing in the past five to ten years. I think the time has come to rectify this situation and this sort of simple cut and peel strategy, I believe, strikes the right balance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. Well, we thank you. Uh, we now have three members to need to go over to the floor to cast their vote, so we will be in recess for probably around 10, 15 minutes. Jeffrey Eisenach, uh, President of the Progress and Freedom Foundation. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you for having me here today. Let me begin by noting that while I serve as President of the Progress and Freedom Foundation, the views I express are my own, not necessarily re represent those of the Foundation or its board or its staff. I, I would note that we have at the Progress and Freedom Foundation dedicated uh, ourselves to studying the digital revolution and its implications for public policy, and that's meant for the entire seven-year history of, of uh, our little seven-year history is meant studying the telecommunications marketplace and the Federal Communications Commission in particular. Uh, here with me today is uh, our Director of Communication Studies and Senior Fellow Randy uh, May, who is leading a major and comprehensive study of the F FCC uh, looking at uh, its role 
role in deregulation and the need for continued uh, deregulation and FCC reform. Now, the FCC oversees what, you, what is arguably the most important and vibrant sector of the American economy. I brought with me today and made available to the uh, members of the subcommittee uh, something that we publish every year called the Digital Economy Factbook, which is just a compendium of statistics. And you'll find, Mr. Chairman, that one of the things it shows is that the telecommunications sector is in a state of, of transformation from a marketplace characterized by scarcity and monopoly to one of abundance and competition. In passing the Telecommunications Act, the Congress asked, tasked the FCC with implementing a new policy framework consistent with that transformation, and the vision of the Telecommunications Act was clear. It aims to replace monopoly with competition and to impose the discipline of the marketplace in lieu of government regulation. In short, it says to the Commission, facilitate the transition to deregulation to competition, and when you're done, deregulate. But deregulation is a task for which this Commission, at least, has turned out to be poorly suited. As uh, Adam Thera noted, the Commission is larger uh, than uh, five years ago when the Act was passed. It's also, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the extent to which it is, vastly more intrusive into the affairs of the marketplace than it was five years ago. Some examples, in its review of mergers under its vague public interest standard, the Commission engages in what is essentially an exercise in designer regulation with separate and unequal regulatory regimes imposed on similarly situated firms through conditions which are supposedly voluntary but in fact are uh, necessary if the merger is going to be permitted to go forward under a very vague set of criteria. The Commission has refused to forbear from regulating in the local service marketplace for broadband services, and it's now on poise to impose common carrier uh, type regulations on broadband internet offerings by cable services. Uh, it's now looking even at extending itself into the arena of digital broadcasters. And under this commission, under this administration, and under the Telecommunications Act, the commission's now become a social policy agency, something for which I think it's ill-suited administering what former Chairman Reed Hunt called the largest national effort for K-12 through education in our nation's history, namely the so-called E-RAID program. This continuing mission creep would be less troubling if the commission had a better track record of, implementing, of, of implementation. But its track record in that regard, in fact, is poor. As I mentioned, its review of mergers under the public interest standard, in that review, the Commission is able to avoid all of the requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act, which applies only to industry-wide rulemakings. The Commission often fails to meet deadlines, is often engaging in creative interpretations of its statute. Uh, this leads to not only Congress but the courts having to step in and do the agency's job for it in areas as arcane as reciprocal compensation and as central to the agency's mission as the implementation of unbundling and resale requirements in the local telephone loop. And I do need to say, Mr. Chairman, and I, I would hope that, that all of the members of this subcommittee would take a moment to, to visit the uh, website of former Chairman Reed Hunt, uh, which is, Adam was telling me earlier, reedhunt.com, is that correct? Re reedhunt.com. And I gather this book is available free. I, I wouldn't pay for it if I could avoid it. But, um, but, but it's a book that everyone should look at because as someone who formerly served as the chief of staff in an independent regulatory agency, uh, it contains a, a series of... Uh, admissions uh, that uh, in the form really of, 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 of uh, proud admissions, if you will, that suggest that the Commission has been far more involved in and sensitive to political concerns than is appropriate for an independent regulatory agency. And I just think that's something that the, the, the subcommittee should be aware of. Now comes the Commission with its five-year draft strategic plan, which essentially asks the Congress to sign off on a broad new mission for the agency. It's not clear exactly what that mission is. The Commission talks of becoming a market facilitator. It's not clear why in a competitive marketplace this particular market needs its own market facilitator. Many markets seem to f behave just fine without their own industry-specific regulators, but, uh, but it is the Commission's position, I guess, that it, it does need to have such a function. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, the Commission comes forward with no proposals, at least no substantial proposals, for limiting its authority or reducing its activities. Now, I, su I respectfully submit the Commission could and should take a different tack. In my opinion, the advent of competition in the, com in the communications marketplace should result not in a larger and more powerful regulatory agency, but in a scaling back of both the cost of the agency and its intrusion into decisions better made in the private sector. And in the report we release in December, we will present some comprehensive recommendations for how to do that. Now, in summary, it seems to me there are four 
uh, suggestions that I would offer for this subcommittee's consideration for the consideration of Congress in general. First of all, the Commission should be required to make explicit the criteria it uses to judge the public interest, starting with its application of the public interest standard to the license transfers involved in mergers. If the Commission's reviewing license transfers as such, then it should limit its deliberations to the direct implications of those transfers. Conversely, if it's going to engage in a broader antitrust-like merger review, it ought to do so do using its authority under the Clayton Act. Secondly, the Commission should get out of the social, social policy arena, and that includes transferring the functions of the E-Rate program over to the Department of Education, which would be in a better position to run them. Third, Congress should take, undertake a comprehensive examination of the Commission's structure. Proposals have been made to reorganize the Commission along less stovepipe, industry-specific lines to reflect convergence. That's something the Commission should do, and Congress should assist and, ins and insist on. I also think Congress should consider additional approaches to streamlining the agency and would agree with uh, what Mr. Thierer said with respect to offloading some of its functions to other kinds of agencies and looking at alternative structures. Fourth, and, and keeping in mind that the strategic plan presented by Chairman Kennard, at least all of the versions I've seen to date, are still labeled draft, uh, Congress should insist on a draft 2.0. Rather than focusing on creating new missions and expanded responsibilities, Draft 2.0 ought to point the way to the smaller and less expensive and less powerful FCC that one would think would be the natural consequence of telecommunications competition and deregulation. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Well, we thank you. That's very helpful, all, in, all three of you. Uh, we're now going to go to questions for this panel, and we're going to have five minutes per person alternating uh, between the majority and the minority. Let me start in with Inspector General Feaster, if I might. What's your view of the FCC's initiatives to improve its financial management operations and accounting systems? Um, I believe um, since they've made the commitment several years ago to improve the systems, they've um, gone a long way. Um, as we pointed out in our uh, fiscal 1999 financial statement audit. Uh, they've been successful in improving conditions to date, uh, but they do have um, some areas uh, that need improvement. The statement was qualified on the basis of uh, getting a hold of the property and plan and equipment accounts in a, a more accurate manner, uh, and they've implement, are implementing procedures to do that. Um, there are a lot of things that they need to do, but they're in the. It's, it's a, uh, a multi-year uh, solution to the problems we've identified in that audit. We are currently conducting uh, an FY 2000 financial statement audit, which we will review their progress towards these goals. Chairman uh, Kennard's testimony notes that the year 2000 failure caused difficulties with an electronic complaint processing system. What was the magnitude of that failure? I, I'm not familiar. I, I, my well, guess the, is it, the it Y2K would, bit. The Y2K. They, they basically went through the Y2K without any major failures that I know about. Uh, we, we looked at uh, the critical systems and uh, they made the process. The only thing I can think of is perhaps the OSCAR system, which well, they're... Well, just taking, uh, the chairman will be here, of course, but this is from his formal statement on page 6, the beginning paragraph, where he says, because of difficulties ca caused by an electronic complaint processing system that was not year 2000 compliant and lack of staff resources, the inventory of informal complaints at one point grew to 154,000 pending cases. Oh. So I just wondered if you as Inspector General have looked in on that or you've made a contract of, with a consulting firm to try and sort it all out. There, um, that was the Oscar system, sir, uh, which is the uh, system that would process these complaints. Uh, I was recently briefed by the acting chief of the uh, Consumer Information Bureau, uh, and I believe the chairman will can testify that significant progress has been made in reducing those complaints to a number of about 36 or 39,000 complaints uh, that are currently pending. So in the past six months, the, the complaints have been reduced. 
uh, let me move on. And uh, the, if you have any comments on these questions, there, all of you, we would welcome your thoughts. How many companies still have not paid for their spectrum auction bids, and how much is outstanding? And Inspector General, what's of your view of the situation? We did a, um, a non-tax delinquent debt study that I think you had a, a great interest in seeing done on a government-wide basis. Um, That's think, right, because there's billions of dollars that I, the taxpayers are losing. I think like 13 billions or 10, t lots of billions. Uh, um, 13 and a half just for Medicare. <laughs> it gets up to several hundred billion. Well, what's the old saw? It, as soon as it starts adding up or something like that. Yeah. Well, but, um, Senator Dirksen's famous yes, sir. words, pretty That's soon it's real money. Yes, sir. Now we're into the trillion age. Poor Senator Dirksen, it, he it, wouldn't. It boggles my mind, the, the, the number of zeros. But um, in, in that particular, we, there are, I, I think, one or two companies that own a significant amount of the debt um, in, in, of that 13 million or whatever the actual number is uh, involved in that. And one of them is in, in litigation and I, I think trying to get some legislation passed. I, I think the chairman could address that a lot better than I could. I, I don't know where they stand right at this present moment. Well, if you have some thoughts on it when you get back to the office, we'll reserve a letter or something and put it in the record at this point. Yes, sir. Uh, have you discovered any cases of fraud or abuse of the spectrum auctions? Um, we had some tangential issues related to uh, the conduct of contractors that were providing support to the, uh, the spectrum auctions group. Uh, we didn't, uh, and uh, one of the contractors ended up going to jail for 18 months and was fined a significant amount, well, $40,000, a significant amount of money to me anyhow. Um, and, uh, but we found nothing in the spectrum auctions process that was a problem. Um, well, uh, if again, if uh, you change your mind on that, uh, we'll have a letter at this point in the record. Uh, I've used my five minutes. I now turn to Mr. Turner for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Feaster, you heard uh, both of our other witnesses offer certain suggestions and recommendations for streamlining of the agency. Uh, what's your views on the suggestions that they made? Uh, that's a hard one. Uh, this, I had, one of the ways that the Inspector General gets into trouble is to make comments on stuff he hasn't studied. And I haven't looked at that issue. Uh, I, I believe it's a, uh, a, a more of a discussion between, uh, or within and between members of the, the public groups like this and the Congress. Um, I, I've been at the commission since 1974, not in this capacity, uh, and I've seen the, the commission grow in both size and responsibility. Um, new programs have come in. The Spectrum Auctions is one, one of those programs where um, a substantial amount of effort is put into um, collecting and uh, dealing with the uh, actual auctioning of Spectrum. Um, so I, I think my official position is I have, I have no comment um, on that since I haven't done extensive work in that area. Well, from your vantage point, do you, as Inspector General, do you see any areas within the agency that you think are uh, bloated to the extent that they could be pared down or they could be more efficient, uh, could um, operate uh, more cost effective? I guess two comments I'd have on that. One, I think the move towards a functionally oriented uh, commission is, a, is the right move. Uh, in the past, in my other positions, I've, I've advocated that type of structure, and the Commission has taken steps to do that in the enforcement area and in the consumer information area. Um, I, I think that helps meet the rising demand. The, the public keeps wanting information and services from the Commission. I think we, we average a, a, a million hits a day on our websites. Uh, there's a constant demand for information and services from, from the Commission by the public. 
Um, so I don't see the workload decreasing. What the commission has tried to do is using um, computers to meet that workload. We, we have a substantial investment in the computer area, and we are constantly involved with the, uh, the chief information officer to review the use of computers and the security of the computers, an area that I know that the chairman and the committee are interested in. Um, so I, I can't come up with any areas that are really, as you suggested, maybe bloated. Um, I, I think the demands of the commission are ever growing. Thank you. The um one of the comments that you made, Mr. Eisenach, was the recommendation that you said the Commission should get out of the social policy arena as expeditiously as possible. And what you cited in that <clears throat> regard were federal education programs uh, should not be run by the FCC, but by the Department of Education. And that universal service program should be further targeted, not further expanded. Uh, I'd like for you to expand on your thoughts there. I know those are important programs, and uh, we have a lot of benefits, particularly in areas of country like I represent, where those are important programs. But wh why do you feel so strongly about transferring that function? Well, two two really separate issues, both related by the, in the sense that they are both related to social policy or, or social policy-like programs. With, with respect to the E-rate, um, you have a program which is intrinsically and inherently an educational program. Its purpose and design is to facilitate the use of computers, the availability of computers in America's schools. Um, the, focus in, the focus in that program, of course, is on the hardware, and one of the things I think that happens by having it at the Federal Communications Commission as opposed to someplace like the Department of Education with a broader, uh, with a broader view uh, is that the, the program is not then easily integrated, for example, with programs for training uh, teachers, which is an essential part of bringing technology in a more useful way into the classroom. So I just think on, on an overall basis that a, an agency like the Department of Education, which has the ability to integrate uh, and balance the use, of, the use of technology in the classroom, would be in a better position to manage that well. <clears throat> the... Uh, a separate issue there goes to the funding of that program and whether that program is best funded by imposing essentially taxes on telecommunication services as opposed to a broader funding source like the general revenues of the federal government. I think we would all agree that there is some role for the government in that, and I, I'm not getting into the question of whether we're spending too much or too little. It may be too little for all I know. Uh, but I think that the source of funds, we've done a lot of work on telecommunications taxes, and those taxes are extremely uh, regressive uh, and extremely harmful to people's ability now to get on the internet because they affect, in effect, uh, internet access when you're taxing telecommunication. So, so that's the, the E-rate. Uh, on the universal service uh, issue, this is obviously a very controversial and a very, very extraordinarily complex set of programs. But uh, the long and short of it, I'd say, is the need to uh, focus that uh, assistance on people most in need and not to be subsidizing the urban rich if or the rural rich, if you will, the Ted Turners in Wyoming uh, or Aspen, Colorado, who are benefiting from those subsidies as much as your constituents who may need them much more. We now turn to uh, Mr. Walden for five minutes for questioning this panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't know that I'll use the full five minutes, but I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today and to ad address the, the panel. I, I would at the outset of my questions just like for full public disclosure and disclaimer to uh, put on the record that I am a licensee of the, of the FCC. We have owned and operated uh, radio stations in Oregon for uh, uh, since 1986 and my, my family before that dating back uh, to 1967 and actually in Oregon and broadcasting to 1934 I think is when my dad got his ham license so uh, we've been in the business a long time so it is with some concern that I, I come here and, and discuss some of this but it's also with a hands-on understanding of being on the receiving end of, of the FCC, both good and, and I think areas where there might be some room for improvement. Um, Mr. Feaster, I have a, a question for you. Your testimony uh, talks about the civil monetary penalty program. Do you think that small businesses suffer more from those penalties compared to large corporations? And I don't know if you have that schedule in front of you, but as I recall, penalty for literally having something out of order in the file for the public file can be a, a $5,000 penalty. And I don't know if all of our committee files are kept in exact order, but I doubt the penalty would be 5000 if they weren't. 
Uh, the, the civil monetary penalty study we did, we were looking more into the processes and procedures of uh, recording the fines and looking at more of the financial aspects of it and really didn't do any work in terms of the potential impact on small business type operations. So I, I can't make that judgment. How, how did these, how does this finding uh, a set of civil forfeiture, civil monetary penalties uh, for the types of things that are being dealt with, how do they stack up against other agencies? Do, can you speak to that at all? I know you're probably specific to, to this one, but. I, I really can't, I, I haven't done any comparison. The, um, I, I do know that the, 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 the base schedule was, set by statute, by congressional statute. And from that, a, uh, a subschedule was developed to, as, as it breaks down to various offenses. Um, I haven't had any complaints by um, broadcasters, for instance, about the unfairness of their, um, the, the enforcement actions taken against them. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that they would use my office as a vehicle. Okay. I was going to suggest they may not even know to go to an IG, for example, unless they've um, some People tend to find us when they have a problem. Uh, we, get, we get a lot of complaints about telephone-type bills, which really we don't handle. Um, but um, they, they tend to find us in the phone book. A lot of times we're, we're the first contact they have other than our information center in Gettysburg, and we refer them to the proper people to talk to. I'd, I'd like to commend the, the commission and its staff for the, the work they're doing in improving and, and developing the website. I, I think that can be, a, is and can be a very useful tool. I, I think there are some areas where there's room for improvement. I, I myself obviously have used it and it may just be my explorer. I don't know. I, I sometimes uh, am frustrated that things haven't been updated. Uh, and I, I think that's probably a problem for all of us with our websites. But. I know some of the information didn't seem to be updated as regularly as I would have hoped. Now, were they, weren't they in a transition period, though? Yes, sir. And um, they've, they've made uh, significant progress in that area. And in fact, the, the CIO is sitting back in the back row right now about uh, the oversight of that. Um, two things. The website was rated very highly in a study recently that. done. Uh, we also have um, just completed work in, in uh, checking on the accessibility of the website to disabled individuals and uh, although we haven't released the report yet in, in draft it looked very good so I think in those two areas uh, they're improving um, just the overall access and specialized access let, let me ask anybody on the panel who may want to respond D does the FCC have statutory authority to regulate content on private websites to regulate what, what's on there and what's not? Uh, I, I do not believe they do without con some sort of congressional, clear congressional statutory approval to do so. There are probably general, maybe some general authority they could try to construe under the mass media responsibilities, but I doubt that would wash with a court. Um, I do not think it would work, no, because websites are not licensed, and that's the right. difference. Mr. We're, we're regulated by the FCC, so. Pardon I, me? I don't think so. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I, that's two of us. <laughs> well, I, I just say briefly the the one of the things I touch on in my testimony is the existence of this very vague and undefined public interest uh, authority at the commission, which uh, is ultimately the thor the authority that the commission relies on in many, uh, and to some extent, in all of its activities, uh, and that that authority is as broad as three FCC commissioners uh, find the public interest to be uh, on a given day. Okay. So. I've, I've expended my time. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now uh, turn to the gentleman from New York, Major Owens, in five minutes, and that will be the last round. The other uh, questions will be submitted to all of you, and if you don't mind, fill them in, and we'll put them at this point in the record, and then we'll have a chance to uh, have the chairman, uh, Mr. Kennard, who's here. Uh, so, M Major Owens, all Please. yours for five minutes. One quick question to the Inspector General. Uh, Recent audit, audits have indicated improvements need to be made in the FCC's collection systems. Uh, would you say we made some uh, strides toward uh, making those improvements? Many federal agencies, like the Department of Agriculture, have a history of, of uh, allowing uh, corporations and private interests to get away with murder with respect to uh, paying their debts. Uh, decades go by and, 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 and they, they don't pay large amounts, and corporations and the corporate culture in general might have begun to see government in this way in general and 
not uh, want to pay their pay their debt uh, fees, et cetera. So what 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 is the situation? Respect um, improvements to collections. A, a couple points. One, the collection system itself. Um, there will be a new collection system. I am told, um, like January of nineteen. Excuse me, January of two thousand and one. Uh, which uh, we, we did an audit of the old system and found uh, problems. They've, they've made minor changes to that to address the problems, but they will have a new collection system at uh, the beginning of the calendar year. Um, they're also, um, the uh, chief financial officer is uh, conducting a, an aggressive program of, of following up on past year's non-payments of regulatory fees. Uh, to make sure that nobody um, has the ability to skip paying a required fee to the government, uh, and um, that this rides hurt on the auction payments, uh, both the, the auction, auction payments and um, both on regulatory fees also. Mm. Um, and um, it is I, we have continuing discussions almost on a weekly basis about regulatory fee collection and auction payments fees. Um, so this is part of the, uh, we will be reviewing this portion of the financial statement um, in our 2000 audit of the financial statement. So we will be looking at those areas specifically. Do you have any concrete recommendations about what other steps might be taken? Um, I, I think they've, we, we've had this discussion in the past with them and they're basically implemented in a very aggressive program. Uh, they have two approaches. One, the new collection system uh, will more accurately record fees, and two, um, there be uh, there's a system called cores, which will be making sure we have very tight links between our licensees and the financial transactions that they do make to make sure that everybody's paying their their fair amount and the required amount. This, thank you, Mr. Eisenhock. You mentioned the E-rate, uh, and I. Uh, would like for you to expand uh, a little on that. Uh, I'm reminded of the picture on the front page of the New York Times today with folks in Yugoslavia are rebelling, and it's a gorgeous picture of uh, people up rising up and, and, and seizing control of their own destiny, their own government. If you tamper with the E-rate at this point, you'll have the teachers and the students <laughs> and a whole lot of people out there uh, rising up, I assure you, uh, against uh, any effort to try to, to lessen the impact of the E-rate or make it weaker. Uh, and it seems to me a proposal to move it, uh, the, the administration of it, to the Department of Education would certainly weaken the effort because what you have, we've gone through a stormy uh, set of uh, skirmishes with the big corporations in the telecommunications industry. Some have even gone to court and you've had uh, members of Congress uh, who've threatened uh, the, the agency and all kinds of things have happened uh, as we pursue the implementation of the E-rate and we finally came out and. Uh, it has been implemented now, and you can't take it away from the people, but uh, it seems to me that it's mainly a communications matter for one, uh, not education, but for two, uh, there's a need for some power in terms of making the giants who resisted having the E-rate implemented in the first place, uh, making them continue to stay in line uh, and saving, any, uh, saving the E-rate from any counterattacks that might develop out there. Uh, you know, I, I admire the Department of Education. I think it's one of the most important functions of government, but it's one of the weakest agencies in, in terms of uh, its clout right now. So could you elaborate on your proposal to move the E-rate to the Department of Education? Well, I, I've, I've recently um, had the opportunity to listen to uh, FTC Commissioner Orson Swindle uh, speak on uh, unrelated matters, but he's he's, uh, he's said on several speeches I've recently heard him say that, that all government programs have three things in common, a beginning, a middle, and no end. Uh, I think what you just said, uh, Mr. Owens, uh, suggests why. I think it is very difficult to reform or modify programs once they're put in place. Uh, and I think even those with the best of intentions, uh, you know, are subject to uh, well, the some, attack. Some, that sometimes somehow, that's good. We don't want the E-rate and Social Security to come to an end. Well, I, I, I understand that. I, I, I think that. I think from a larger perspective, and I, and I would not want the perfect to, the, to be the enemy of the good here, I think there is a general consensus 
is that there is a role uh, for government, for the federal government, in helping to uh, see to the implementation of internet availability in our nation's schools. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, that there are good government reasons for moving that program where it could be integrated time. with the programs of the Department of Education. Time is up on this, and we're sorry about that. We'll uh, probably ask the chairman the same thing. Uh, but I want to thank all three of you uh, for coming here and giving us a perspective uh, which raised some very interesting questions and uh, we'll be in touch with you uh, in terms of some of these questions to put them in the book and in the record. So thank you very much for coming. We'll now ask the uh, Chairman of the Federal Communications Commission uh, to come forward. We welcome you. Uh, this is the first time he's testified before this subcommittee. And uh, uh, Chairman uh, Kennard, I understand you had some scheduling conflicts, and I appreciate your effort to join us today. And as I think you know, the, since it is an investigating committee, we will swear you in. And your aides, too. Any, anybody that will talk and get on the record, and it doesn't matter how deep is I've seen the Pentagon come in here with 15 people, but anyhow, uh, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. As the chairman, did you take the oath? Yes, I said I do. Okay. Uh, the clerk will note that all three, uh, the chairman and his uh, aides, will uh, have accepted the oath. and. Uh, Please proceed any way you'd like. Uh, we prefer it not to hear, hear what we have already read, uh, but we'd like a summary. Uh, uh, if you want to emphasize a particular paragraph, fine, read it. But uh, this way, there will be a chance for the members of the panel on both sides to ask questions, and uh, we won't be here forever. Very Thank well. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before this subcommittee today. Uh, with me, uh, I have two very important uh, members of the senior management at the FCC. To my left is Mr. Ron Stone, who is our chief information officer. To my right is Mark Rieger, who is our, our chief financial officer. Um, both of these gentlemen um, are responsible for areas that um, are within the jurisdiction of this committee, and I know that. Um, uh, uh, they will be able to provide a number of the details that you're seeking. I'm pleased to uh, present testimony concerning the management, information, technology, and financial operations and activities of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, the FCC is an independent regulatory agency with regulatory responsibilities for uh, interstate communications activities of the wireless, wireline, satellite, and radio and television broadcast industries. We have a total agency staff of uh, 1,975 full-time equivalents and a fiscal year budget of $210 million. Uh, principally, our, our mission is guided by the Communications Act of 1934. Its mission is to promote competition, protect consumers, and provide access for every American to existing and advanced communication services. As you know, Mr. Chairman, the last few years have been a time of momentous change in the telecommunications industries here and around the world, and so they have been a time of change in the administration and management of the FCC. We have uh, continued to um, work hard to keep up with the pace of change by expanding and enhancing our information technology program, both internally and in the electronic filing systems available to the public. We've also made many improvements to the agency's financial management systems uh, to oversee the wide range of congressionally authorized revenue generating programs now within the agency's purview. In the area of uh, financial management, the Commission completed its first ever audited financial statement for fiscal year 1999. We're very proud of that uh, financial audit. Uh, we did it on a voluntary basis. It's not required of our agency to do so, but we felt that it was important given the many um, revenue generating activities that we're now in, including uh, auctions and our extensive fee program, that we have uh, a high degree of, uh, of fiscal discipline at the agency. Uh, I have a, um, uh, a pretty extensive um, oral statement here, but uh, in the interest of time and as a 
as a concession to the shortness of life. I will not uh, read my entire statement, but I will sum up what I think are the principal challenges that are facing the agency today. These markets are transitioning from an era of monopoly regulation to competition. This is not just something that's happening in the United States. It is, in fact, a worldwide movement. We have been charged by the Congress with introducing competition in these markets. The competition is now the organizing principle of our law and policy in this area. And the entire world is watching what we are doing at the FCC. It, uh, it, it, it makes it a profoundly important time for us because the world is, is now waking up to the power of the Internet and e-commerce. and. As Congressman Owen well knows, the, the importance of technology in uplifting our people, educating our children, improving health care. And we know now that the best way to get these benefits to the public is through an open, competitive telecommunications marketplace. We have been charged at the agency with making that happen. And we have been quite successful in uh, I believe, in intervening with a strong regulatory hand where necessary to pry open historic monopoly markets and uh, force incumbents to deal with new entrants, new competitors, but at the same time easing off the hand of regulation in areas where we see the markets becoming more competitive. So you can see we've attempted to create a careful balance, intervening where there are blocked arteries or bottlenecks, but then easing off where we see competition developing, like in the long distance marketplace or in the wireless marketplace. At the same time, we have been uh, very reluctant to regulate in areas that are new and innovative and dynamic, like the Internet. Uh, we have uh, uh, been very forceful in articulating that um, the Internet has been an area of fertile innovation, and it's grown precisely because there hasn't been a lot of government micromanagement and regulation. On our management side, uh, the things that uh, we are most proud of is the uh, successful implementation of our auction program, uh, our website, which has recently been rated very high. Uh, a, a, um, the Tubman Public Policy Center rated over 1,800 government websites around the country. We were number four. Uh, and, uh, it's, um, and we get about a million hits a day. Um, as I travel around the country, I'm finding that because we have converted a lot of our processes to uh, electronic filing and, and because we have a very quality website, people are able to interact with the agency around the country and indeed around the world without having to have a presence in Washington. That's very, very important. Um, Congressman Walden, you, you talked about uh, your um, family background in broadcasting. Well, as I'm sure you know, uh, now broadcasters around the country can file applications with us electronically, communicate via email with our staff, and it's been a very, very satisfying thing to see. Well, with that, I, I, um, I will conclude my, uh, my prepared opening remarks, and I would be happy to answer any questions that the subcommittee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Kennard. Uh, I'm going to fill in for Chairman Horn while he goes to vote, and then uh, we'll trade places. Um, I have a couple of questions I wanted to ask, and then uh, I'll turn to uh, my colleagues who may have questions as well. Um, one, I, I just want to draw your attention to uh, something I hope that you will, will work on. <laughs> and I guess uh, I'm drawing on my background, which I guess is what makes a legislative body uh, a good thing to have people of different backgrounds, because some of us are actually on the ground and the receiving end. And that's not necessarily the, the cost of the regulatory fees, but just the process you have to go through to fill out the forms and comply. And, and one thing that I remember calling my senator when I didn't think I was going to be in this process, certainly a couple of years ago, after spending many hours going through the notice and all the forms, trying to figure out which code I needed to put in which box at which point, and then being referred to something I couldn't find. And this was probably predating some of your internet improvements on your website. But the thing that's always struck me is you have nine days to get it in. You can't pay your bill before September 11th, I think, this year, and it had to be there by September 20th. Now, I cannot imagine running my business and telling my clients, you've got a nine-day window and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fine you 25% if you're late. 
in your payment and having anybody do business with me. Now, I don't have a choice. I mean, you do sign my license, so I'm, I'm here in your humble servants. But I, I guess I've always wanted to ask that question. I never thought I'd be in this position where I could. And so I'm here. And I, I'd, I'd just be curious to know why, why that closed window? Why not let people file it ahead of time? Why a nine-day window for every broadcaster in America to pay their bill? Well, the regulatory fee program, um, <clears throat> as you know, is mandated by the Congress. Right. And uh, every year we have to go through a, a process of establishing what the regulatory fees are going to be right. for the year. What we try to do is give people um, as much notice as we can early in the year of what we think the fee structure will be right. um, so that they can prepare um, to, to make these payments. Uh, and then uh, once the, uh, the fee structure is established, usually in the fall of the year, we uh, go through uh, you know, a process of having to collect the money in, in fairly short order. Um, it's an issue that uh, I'm glad you brought to our attention and something that I'll focus on and see if there's a way that we can make it uh, easier on our licensees. Because yeah, this, this does come out like August 2nd was the one this year. But I've just never seen an agency that wouldn't accept your money earlier. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, 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 so anyway, I, I, throw that, I throw that out there. Is a, I know you've made a lot of improvements, and, and I commend you on the website. The ability to download a lot of forms and do a lot of this work is a tremendous asset. I mean, I shudder sometimes at the thought of 24-hour government and what it can really mean, but I also appreciate the fact in the middle of the night I can pull up all kinds of information, technical and otherwise, and, and be able to continue to move on in, in terms of, of business. Let me turn to some other policy issues. Does your agency have plans um, to introduce new regulations or guidance affecting religious broadcasters between now and, and the end of the year? Because that's obviously been one I've gotten a lot of mail on, a lot of interest in. Uh, first of all, in, in response to your, uh, your earlier issue, my uh, chief financial officer has just informed me that we would be happy to accept your money earlier if you would like to send it in before the September deadline. But, well, I, and I appreciate that, but your own rules say I can't. No, actually, the it says it sets up a fee window by when you can pay, but you may pay that any day after the public notice is released. Now, you wouldn't know the amount till the public notice is released each year. Really? After congressional review, well, you're going to you're going to save uh, you're going to cost Federal Express a lot of money then because. Well, I'm also going to tell you, sir, that there were two new website options available to you this year right. that you could pay electronically, and both right. those were up uh, to try to help people right. not send their payment. Because this says the the fee payments must be received by the commission during the period beginning September 11th and ending September 20th. Yes, but this year for the first time you could send it in any day after the August release 2nd. of the public notice and we were set up to accept and oh, take okay. your payment. All right, well that's it's interesting because that's the, the one from August 2. Correct. Okay, good to know. Back to the religious broadcasting policy. Any plans to do any new rules between now and the end of the uh, year? Not, not at this time. We um, uh, addressed this issue uh, earlier in the year, the very controversial uh, uh, clarification of our of our policies in this area. So, I don't anticipate that we'll be addressing it again. Okay. I think we'll need to recess because I need to go vote. Okay. Uh, being the only one left not to, and so I'll put the committee in recess and we'll return. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, uh, where are we in your, uh, with the getting us all over there to vote? Uh, where are you on your statement? I have um, given my opening statement, Mr. Chairman, and I received some initial questioning from Mr. Walden. I see. Okay. Uh, sorry about it. We've had a series of votes, but uh, that's what has to be done around Quite here. Right. And of course, if uh, you have this jurisdiction, I suspect, over little beepers, if you could sort of neutralize the ones on <laughs> Capitol Hill, we could hold more hearings. I think but we could help you with that's that. That's democracy. <laughs> well, that's what I wanted.
was uh, Mr. Walden uh, doing the questioning? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I might intervene a little bit with that. Uh, we have a few questions in general. <coughs> and uh, there was an article uh, in the uh, folder you had. Uh, how has the commission prepared itself to prevent another next wave debacle in its spectrum auction program? That's one of our concerns. Mm -hmm. So we'd appreciate your comments. Certainly. When Congress authorized the FCC to conduct spectrum auctions in 1993, the statute specifically directed the FCC to experiment with different auction methodologies. One of those methodologies was uh, allowing small businesses to uh, get installment payments in order to uh, ease their, the financial burden uh, that they would encounter in these auctions. Uh, and it was a very well-intentioned effort to ensure that when we went to the auction regime, we would not uh, inadvertently create a, an environment where small businesses couldn't participate. So in one of our first major auctions for the what we call the C-Block uh, PCS auction, we extended credit, in effect, to small businesses. Uh, some of them uh, overbid, got overextended, and, uh, and that's... Uh, the problem we ran into. Uh, since that time, we have not extended installment payments. We've come up with other methodologies to create incentives for small businesses like bidding credits. And so I don't anticipate that that particular problem will, will reoccur. You heard, I think, some testimony on the E-Ray uh, business in terms of should it be in the Department of Education, should it stay in the Federal Communications Commission? What are your feelings on that? Well, I strongly disagree with the notion that the E-Ray program should be moved to the Department of Education. Uh, here's why. Uh, the E-Ray program is a part of our universal service policies, which the FCC has administered for decades. Those policies are largely responsible for the fact that in our country, we have the highest telephone penetration of any country in the world. On average, 94% of Americans have access to a phone. That's because the FCC, over time, has administered policies to ensure, policies known as universal service, to ensure that people in rural areas get phone service, uh, low-income people, people in inner-city areas. The E-rate is an extension of the, the, that policy. It was an extension that was mandated by the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And so it is really a part of the core of the Commission's responsibilities to ensure that the phone network reaches all people. Now, of course, the phone network is not just delivering voice telephony, it's delivering data in the Internet. And so our responsibility, appropriately, is to ensure that those networks reach all people. Uh, you, you know, I believe, that this uh, subcommittee uh, has a great interest in making sure the loans that have been made to various agency come uh, true and are fulfilled and put the money back in the Treasury to help the next generation. So I'm curious how much money is owed to the FCC from its spectrum auctions and what's being done to collect those amounts? Well, if memory serves, uh we have collected about $15 billion in the auction program, and about $5 billion is outstanding, most of it owed by one company, Next Wave. Uh, we have worked very, very hard to um, uh, advocate that the United States Congress change the statute so that it is clear that if someone defaults in the payment of, of monies owed us in a spectrum auction, that the FCC can immediately re-auction the license. We plan to re-auction the, uh, uh, the next wave spectrum, if you will, uh, December 12th. And uh, uh, we're, unfortunately, it, it's, it's taken some time because the statute wasn't entirely clear and there has been litigation in the bankruptcy courts and the appellate courts. But that clarification would be very, very helpful in ensuring that the American public get the value of this spectrum. Have you been uh, sent a, a recommendation from your office through the Office of Management and Budget, which would clear it on behalf of the President, to the Congress so the relevant committees can act on that? Yes, in, in fact, we have. We have um, 
Beginning, I believe, in 1997, we've sent up um, language that would fix this problem uh, every year since then. Um, and we've worked with OMB and uh, uh, the relevant committees, the Commerce Committee, the Budget Committee, and the Senate. And it hasn't gotten anywhere. No, it's always very controversial. In fact, it's controversial as we speak. There are efforts to try to um, address this issue through our appropriations bill at this time. Well, I see I've got 30 seconds on the five, so I'll maintain that later. And uh, now yield to my colleague, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner, the ranking member on the committee. Thank you. Five Mr. Chairman, minutes. welcome to our committee. We appreciate you. your being here. I come from a, an area in rural East Texas uh, that by and large has found itself on the wrong side of the digital divide. And I was curious as to what uh, the FCC is doing to address uh, the gap between those who have access to the information highway and those of us who do not. I, I do not want to be in a position um, to have to look back and think that the information highway passed us by and that all we have is a, a dirt on route that uh, we can't use too well. So what hope do we have in, in rural areas of the country to be sure that we can have the same access that everyone else has? There's a lot that's being done. Uh, the FCC is very, very focused on this issue. We have a very, very aggressive program. I'll highlight some of the things that, that we've been doing. Um, one is we are reevaluating our universal service programs on an ongoing basis to find ways to ensure that the phone network reaches all people. Um, every year we send a report to Congress on advanced services to make sure that as the network improves and starts rolling out such things as broadband uh, access, that people in rural areas are not uh, on the wrong end of the digital divide. We're also focusing on population, uh, populations and, and areas that are at particularly at risk. Um, la just last week we had a, the first ever uh, conference where we pulled together over 100 leaders of tribal governments to um, assist them in finding ways to ensure that people living on tribal lands and Indian reservations are not left behind. This is the most at-risk population. Uh, I mentioned before 94 percent of Americans have a phone, but if you look on, in some tribal lands, percentage on average drops to 50 percent. Uh, and in so, on some reservations, like the Navajos, for example, it's below 20 percent. And we, ju we just have to rectify that situation. Um, we are also uh, aggressively promoting wireless technology, satellite and terrestrial wireless, as ways to extend access into rural and remote areas, because those technologies are often more efficient in delivering phone service in, uh, in remote areas. So there, it, it's, it's a huge agenda for us at the FCC, and there's a number of policy things that we've adopted or have ongoing. Are some of the European countries ahead of us in developing the wireless Internet? And this is a this is a raging debate. Um, we have taken a different approach in the United States. The Europeans have uh, sort of it's a philosophical difference. They um, imposed a uniform standard early on. Um, they have a more coordinated uh, government industry policy. We um, uh, went a, d a different way. I, I tend to believe that our approach ultimately is the best approach because it, we put our faith in the marketplace and ultimately we have more innovation in our marketplace. Um, and I think that the benefits of that will be seen as the next generation of wireless services come on board, what, what we call third generation wireless. One other issue that I wanted to briefly ask you about, uh, this, probably, this issue probably generates more mail in my office uh, over the last year or so than any other one subject, and that is being in a rural area where it's hard to receive a television signal by an antenna. Uh, we have a, a lot of very unhappy constituents who have been upset with uh, the fact that they're not able to receive a, a signal and that the, of course, the law we passed, the Satellite Home Viewers Improvement Act, uh, mandated the FCC to develop a, a new signal strength uh, model for determining mm -hmm. whether satellite owners are eligible to receive distant um, broadcast networks from their satellite provider. but. I want to know how 
the FCC is doing in making progress toward developing that new model? Because I still hear some complaints a lot of time from from my satellite owners that they're not uh, being uh, provided access um, to some of the signals they think they should be, and in many cases have been turned down um, when they make application to receive those signals. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, Congressman, the uh, the statute, the uh, Satellite Home Viewer Improvement Act, uh, established some pretty tight statutory deadlines for the FCC to implement that law. We are in the process of doing that. The, uh, the precise issue that you referenced, the redefinition of the so-called grade B contour, is uh, uh, that proceeding is underway. And I'm confident we'll meet our statutory deadline. We've, we've sought comment on it. I, I believe the deadline is toward the end of this year, and, and we'll, we'll meet it. Do you think that's going to resolve uh, the issue once you do that? It's hard for me to say at this point whether we'll have 100 uh, percent resolution. Uh, I think the more uh, difficult problem is, as oftentimes in our area, is uh, we, we deal with some very litigious parties. And uh, there are lots of rumblings that uh, Satellite Home Viewer Act is going to be challenged in court. and uh, that could hold us up. Um, but I think fundamentally Congress uh, was very wise in passing that act uh, because the uh, this whole area of the law was antiquated and really needed to be updated and it you know it's my hope that uh, that we'll have a solution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman from New York, Major Owens, five minutes for questioning. Yes, Mr. Secretary, I first want to salute you, congratulate you and thank you and your predecessor, Reed Hunt, and uh, the Clinton-Gore administration for operating in a way with policies and initiatives that let the American people know that the airways belong to all of us. You know, for too long, uh, it appeared that the airways were the property of a, an elite group that got there first, and they ran things pretty much as they saw fit. Uh, in the process of making certain that the airways serve all the people, uh, you've taken some steps that have been quite controversial and quite uh, met a quite a bit of opposition. Uh, two of those steps are the establishment of the E-rate and the implementation of the E-rate, and the uh, second is this, the, the latest initiative on low-power uh, radio stations. Uh, could you bring us up to date as to where the opposition to the E-rate is now in terms of court cases that are still being uh, pursued out there, and, and what kind of uh, uh, impediments are you experiencing? And uh, do the same th in the case of low-power radio. Um, certainly. Uh, first of all, Congressman, I, uh, I want to thank you for, uh, uh, for what you just said um, about our efforts at the FCC. Uh, but uh, I think it also should be known for the record that we were not alone in those efforts. And you, sir, in particular, were instrumental in making the E-rate happen. You were one of the early supporters of the program. I recall you came to the FCC and were the first member of Congress to testify in support of the E-rate program. So I think that's an accomplishment that we should uh, both share. Uh, the E-rate program itself, I th as you pointed out earlier, has really been recognized around the country as being very, very important to the next generation of Americans. Uh, it has literally touched um, the lives of about 40 million American school children, will wire a million classrooms to the Internet by the end of this year, and people are recognizing that. We were successful in beating back uh, the major constitutional and statutory challenges to the E-rate. Um, our main challenge now is to continue to operate the program in a, uh, a well-managed way, and we're working very hard on that. There are no lawsuits still in process? No, no, no major uh, challenges. Um, the, the most major challenge was a, an attack on the E-rate in the Fifth Circuit, and we prevailed. Uh, Low Power FM is uh, uh, a newer program. It was an, initi an initiative that I championed to try to um, allow community-based organizations an opportunity to use the public's airwaves to speak to their communities, churches, schools, uh, nonprofit groups, in an effort to give a little piece of the airwaves back to the people. Um, we adopted rules implementing low power FM in January and opened um, opportunities for these groups to file applications. We've received, I believe, about 1,200 applications. There was uh, there is an effort to kill the program legislatively. Congress passed uh, legislation in the House 
earlier in the year that would, in effect, kill low-power FM. Similar legislation has been uh, offered in the, in the Senate. Um, and there's also an effort to try to kill the program through the appropriations process. I think it would be very, very unfortunate because there are literally thousands and thousands of churches and schools and nonprofit community-based organizations that need an outlet to use the public's airwaves to speak to their communities, and Low Power FM will do that. It will do it in a time when there is increasing consolidation in the airwaves and fewer opportunities for mom-and-pop radio stations and small church stations. So it's a very, very important program for the nation. I think before you cited uh, Indian reservations as one example of a special situation that would be helped at uh, low-power stations, is it possible that we can get some special consideration for certain uh, foreign language, well, language, groups that don't speak English but have large populations, say, in, in places like Brooklyn, uh, New York, have a large Haitian-American population. They really, uh, especially the older people, speak uh, Creole. Mm -hmm. And I even have a Pakistani population. Uh, and uh, for those kinds of groups, is it possible to get some kind of special uh, consideration uh, in the allocation of low-power stations? Well, the, the, the program is designed for just those types of populations. Um, the, the unfortunate thing is that in some of our larger metropolitan areas, the airwaves are already so congested that there aren't that many opportunities for new to squeeze in new low-power licenses. But around the country, I've talked to many, many foreign language groups. I've talked to... Um, um, Creole-speaking Haitians in the South Florida area and uh, Spanish-speaking populations in the, in the Southwest, uh, and some of our um, uh, uh, tribal leaders uh, who want to get low-power FM stations to broadcast in, um, in foreign languages. So it's, it's a very, very important population that this service could serve. Thank you. We now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to follow up on uh, both LPFM and LPTV. Can you tell me what your views are on LPTV and uh, it, what the Commission's plans are now, uh, the rest of this year and early next year, if you're going to take any regulatory initiatives in this area, if you've undertaken any already or considered any? Certainly. It's very interesting. Um, that you raise low power television because I've studied the history of the creation of that service in the in the early 1980s and all the same arguments that are being used to try to kill low power FM were used against low power TV that we didn't need it that it would um, that the stations um, couldn't survive financially if they got these licenses uh, that it would create interference problems for the incumbents and fortunately, the FCC prevailed and created a low-power television service for the country. And that service today is still alive and thriving. And it, it is a wonderful little microcosm of uh, diverse programming on the airwaves. It covers, and as you know, local high school football and basketball games, local news, foreign language uh, programs. And Congress recognized in the last Congress the value of low-power television and in specifically uh, granting some of those stations what we call Class A status, which gives basically gives them uh, a stay of execution uh, as we convert to digital television. So um, that's been a very important service. It's sort of ironic that at the same time Congress was preserving and protecting low-power TV, there were efforts to kill low-power FM, which is an effort to basically do the same thing for the country, but on the radio side. Yeah, my question was, does the Commission have any plans to do anything additional with LPTV? No, uh, not other than um, uh, implementing the legislation to give LPTV stations Class A status. That's the major proceeding. There may be other smaller waivers or uh, proceedings, but I'm not familiar. No with new them. initiatives on LPTV? Uh, no plan. major initiatives, no. Okay. I, I just have a question on LPFM, uh, mm -hmm. because I... I know the struggle the commission has gone through since what 95 really when the when the rules were put in place or or, or thrown out by the courts in terms of how you decided among competing competing applications for broadcast licenses and that led to the whole process of congress saying you know you're going to do it by auction and so really it was a financial entry fee that right. w would make the decision mm -hmm. but I'm just curious uh, on a couple things on LPFM how you're going to select among competing applications, what criteria you will use, and how that will meet a constitutional test when 
the, the criteria that the Commission used to decide among competing commercial licenses couldn't meet that test. And, and second, will LPFM, and I have not read your, your rules on this, but will, will they have the same requirements for public file, candidate access, um, community issues, uh, all of those that, that other broadcast licensees have? in the community and, and do you have the staff to to monitor that? I believe we do uh, and uh, to answer your question this is a non-commercial service so it's a very different um, licensing procedure than we use for the commercial side and the commercial side as you know um, Congress uh, changed this statute in 1997 so we have to auction those licenses right. We we don't like uh, auction non-commercial stations, and so we've we've right. established criteria to make sure that um, we have a way of deciding from between uh, competing applicants, uh, and essentially we look to ensure that those are local community-based organizations that they'll operate on a non-commercial basis. And I'm confident, given our experience with the decades of history with our non-commercial licensing procedures, that 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 is. Um, um, a lawful and constitutional way of selecting. And so you'll have the ability to, to do that. Well, yes. Okay, will, will they have to meet the same requirements? I mean, it is the public's airwaves that we're dealing with here. Will they have the same requirements for, for candidate access, who, people who want to access the, the public's airwaves, like, like other broadcasters do, even public broadcasters? The, the requirements are modified available somewhat in recognition of the fact that these are non-commercial stations. So their mission is to provide a non-commercial service. So we don't have the same tensions as you do on the commercial side where okay. we're always struggling to make sure that the profit motive doesn't interfere with the licensee's uh, um, ability and performance in serving the public interest. So the, to answer your question, uh, the, the, uh, the public interest requirements are different because it's a non-commercial service. And are those are those specific requirements spelled out in your regulations? Yes, now? they are. Okay. And I, I would have I to, it. if you if you want additional yeah. detail, I'd have to provide. And I understand rules for that you. respect. I, it's just an issue I run into as I talk to fellow broadcasters. You know, it's obviously a lot of concern with this kind of change coming. Both Ken, from you've got Senate. 30 seconds coming from me that I didn't use <laughs> last time. So go ahead. You got 30 seconds to. Well, I, I think that really uh, that really covered. Uh, no new rules planned on LPTV between now and the end of the year. Uh, no new rules. If I, I want to make sure I understood on the religious broadcasting issue that was such an issue earlier this year. You're not planning to do anything between now and the end of the year? No, not on the programming issue, no. Okay. All right. I think that, uh, that covers it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, I'm now going to yield myself five uh, minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in your testimony, you noted you'd reduce the backlog of complaints from 154,000 to 39,000. What procedures does the FCC have in general for handling complaints? How does it work? It, it varies somewhat of depending on the, the nature of the complaint. The, com the, the backlog that you mentioned, this 154,000 backlog, or basically what we call informal consumer complaints. This is somebody has a problem with the phone company, a consumer, uh, uh, and they write the FCC a letter. And this backlog piled up over many, many years. And um, this is the first time that we have basically reduced that backlog. We've really, in effect, eliminated it since 1987. Even though there is still a pending backlog of 39,000, of that number, 30,000 have been referred to the carriers, and so we're awaiting their response. So this is a really significant accomplishment for the agency in, in uh, eliminating that backlog. We have backlog reduction uh, plans and, uh, throughout the agency, um, and it's, it's hard for me to answer your question because the, the procedures sort of vary depending on the type of complaint that's filed. Uh, do, what are the role of the commissioners in deciding some of these complaints? Is this strictly a staff effort, or do there are certain things that are really tremendously important that are left to the commissioners? Most of these complaints are handled on delegated authority. Uh, unless there, a complaint raises a new and novel question of law, um, in which case the commission would have to deal with it. Um, but 
I can't even remember in my tenure there as chairman and previously as general counsel where uh, an informal consumer complaint was kicked up to the commission to deal with. And uh, what do they do then? Do they uh, follow various policies that the general counsel's office has, or is it uh, commission policies? It's commission policy. Okay. Uh, what's your view on the recent initiatives to outlaw the use of cellular phones in automobiles? That's popping up all over America. Well, it's... Uh, I really don't uh, have a view that I can express uh, on these uh, various uh, state law efforts. I do know that at the FCC, we do have standards to uh, protect the public health. Um, there are standards that have, are incorporated in our rules. We do testing to make sure that manufacturers comply. Uh, it's an area we've in, in devoted a lot of time to uh, recently, and we've uh, put some new testing equipment in place. But I, I'm really not prepared at this time to give you a view on the, on the various state law efforts. Do you have a cellular phone in your car? Yes, I have two in my car, as a matter of fact. You have two in your yes. car. Well, there was an old joke around here about Senator Dirksen finally got a, a cellular phone of the age, and he said, let's uh, see what uh, Senator Johnson is doing. And, of course, Johnson was a very powerful majority leader, and uh, so he's got the Johnson car, and the uh, driver said, uh, oh, I'm sorry, he's on the other line. So uh, when you get all these lines in the car, I just wonder if we could get it so the people could, again, get their hands on the steering wheel <laughs> and uh, not doing this way. I, I saw one joker the other day, which was putting the hand over here and going, I don't know, maybe he's got a tin ear or something. But uh, it just seems to me you ought to get the, the, the uh, speaker phone or something in the car and not have to hold it. And a lot do do that. And it's it makes a, a lot idea. of sense. And just so you don't have to keep your hands all over it or get a, uh, as we have in computers, just press a button and the whole thing is done. And, uh, but I think they are a real, without question, a real nuisance. Now, if you're bumper to bumper traffic on the San Diego freeway, which I will uh, be on in a few hours, uh, that uh, also is a problem. And uh, you just see people looking around every which way. Not that that will stop them, but uh, they seem to be a real nuisance without. Uh, but they are necessary when you need them for uh, getting a tow truck. Uh, the Federal uh, Communications Commission has seen a lot of disparities in minority and women ownership. I mean, uh, have we really looked at that to the degree to which you get minority and women ownership in the FCC licensing process? And if so, how are you, if you feel you're not, uh, what are you doing to get women and minority with license? It's, it's a very good question and, and something that uh, I've devoted a lot of uh, time and resources of the agency in addressing during my tenure. Um, the, the main challenge we face is this this is an era of consolidation and it's it's harder for new competitors of what any of, of whatever color or gender uh, to get a foothold in many of these markets they are consolidating um, we have worked very hard um, uh, both in uh, in our licensing process uh, historically and also uh, in some of the things that we're preparing to do to try to remedy this issue um, the, um, uh, a number of the things that we have done is, is basically help small and minority companies to get information about how to get into these businesses. We have uh, an office of uh, communications business opportunities that reaches out to small businesses to help provide them information. Um, I'm always working with industry leaders. Excuse me on that point. Yes. Uh, is there any relationship to the Small Business uh, Administration? Because that would provide some financial money. Well, we don't. Uh, we're not a grant or, 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 or uh, making uh, organization. The um, we do coordinate with the SBA, and they participate in our conferences. In fact, uh, at the end of this this month, we're having a presentation by the F SBA to all of our senior managers on how to sensitize the agency to becoming more um, attuned to small business issues, which is, has uh, been a problem historically in the past. Um, 
later this month or in November, we plan to roll out a major uh, set of studies on market entry barriers for minority and women-owned businesses in the communications arena. And I think that's going to be um, a very, very significant look across the board at some of the unique barriers that minority companies face when they're trying to get into these businesses. I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from New York, Major Owens. I have no further questions. Okay. I thank the gentleman. And let me go back to a few uh, rather technical ones. Uh, you heard part of the testimony of the previous panel. What uh, was your reaction to the calls uh, for an FCC reorganization? Well, I think it's a good call, and in fact, we're in the process of reorganizing the FCC as we speak. Um, a year ago, I submitted a strategic plan to the Congress. Uh, it was a five-year strategic plan that basically calls for a very significant overhaul of the FCC uh, to reorganize the agency along functional lines, uh, come up with new and innovative ways to eliminate backlogs, um, convert to a paperless uh, agency. We've uh, proceeded to implement that. I've created two new bureaus, uh, a Consumer Information Bureau and an Enforcement Bureau, which are the first steps in implementing that plan. Um, today, in fact, we're having a senior management retreat where we are uh, taking stock of where we are and in, uh, in our progress toward implementing that plan. So, as I said in my opening statement, um, the agency has got to change. Uh, the markets that we deal with are changing dramatically with uh, convergence and other issues, and, and we're, uh, we're trying to keep up. In uh, books on public administration, they talk about uh, should it be a single agency with an administrator or a commission with a variety of viewpoints. How do you feel about that, being chairman of the situation? Would you like to just be the single administrator and get rid of all your colleagues? <laughs> Some days I do, uh, <laughs> but um, actually, the uh, if you look around the world, uh, some of the countries that have have used a single administrator find that sometimes that approach doesn't work that well. In the United Kingdom, for example, the, uh, our counterpart agency there, Oftel, has had a single administrator for years, and they're they're moving more toward a multi-member commission. Uh, the fact is that uh, multi-member agencies often are more cumbersome almost by definition because you have to coordinate the views of more people. Um, but um, I have found as chairman that the, the interchange and dialogue between the other commissioners really is helpful. And I think um, overall we come up with better policies uh, by um, working with one another to try to come up with uh, a consensus view. Well said. Your colleagues will be smiling tomorrow. Very politic answer, don't you think? <laughs> That's right. The FCC's decision to allocate spectrum suitable for high-definition television was made with the expectation that television stations would use the spectrum in a timely fashion that would serve the American people. Now, the transition to high-definition television has been extraordinarily slow. What's the consequence of this action to the American people? It's one of the major challenges we face, which is... Um, how do we ensure that the American public gets high-quality digital television service? Um, <clears throat> it's a very complicated issue involving a lot of different um, issues, but fundamentally I believe the problem is that the broadcast industry hasn't really coalesced around a business plan for digital television, so the market is not driving this conversion. If the business model was clear, I don't think that, that we would have a transitional problem. Uh, nevertheless, we are doing whatever we can on the public policy side to, uh, to expedite the transition by coming up with interoperability standards, for example, um, goading the industry along, trying to facilitate um, the development of these standards. Um, but it may be necessary for Congress to address this issue again in the future. Um, because uh, this transition uh, uh, is important for the American public, and I, I, for one, am very impatient that it hasn't happened. I'm going to yield uh, to Mr. Walden, who has to leave, uh, uh, gentleman from Oregon. Th thank you questions. very much, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, make one other comment, or, t or maybe two. One is I know in 
Many times when we're dealing with constituents and, and in these hearings, one of the issues that comes up is overzealous uh, enforcement activities and all that. And I would, I would just like to commend the, the Commission that I think in the many years I've been around this industry, it is a, a, a group of people with the field staff who are generally more helpful than they are punitive. They do come in and try and, and, and be helpful. And I, I would commend you for that because I, I think that's to your credit as an agency. Not all agencies follow that same, uh, same process. Um, I, I want to go back to your comment about women minority owned entry or minority access into the broadcast industry because it is difficult. I, I, and financing is clearly has to be one of the big issues trying to line because most of these sales at the small side, the small communities, you end up having to carry a contract. Mm -hmm. when you go to sell. Uh, Congress has passed some legislation recently that does not help in that respect in terms of the tax policy. But wasn't, under your old rules that were, I think, thrown out by the courts, it gave a preference to uh, women and minority participation in the applicant, ap as applicants. Those were thrown out. How do you, is there anything you can do, aside from LPFM, uh, to, to give uh, advantage to minority population women, other than the sort Absolutely. Of uh, I think that the charge. most significant policy mechanism that we've ever had to uh, create really powerful incentives for the sale of broadcast stations to minorities has been the tax certificate program. Mm -hmm. This was a program that allowed the sellers of broadcast stations to defer capital gains on the sale of a station if it was sold to a minority-owned company. Um, the program was initiated in 1978. Unfortunately, it was repealed by Congress in 1995. But during that period of time, uh, the, the overwhelming majority of minority-owned stations um, were made possible through the benefit of the tax certificate policy. Now, there have been efforts to bring that policy back and indeed expand it to some of the other technology areas like wireless, for example. Um, uh, John McCain has been a, um, a, a very vocal proponent of bringing back the tax certificate, as has uh, in the Senate, as has Charlie Rangel in the House. Um, I have been very encouraging of these efforts because I think that uh, if we really want to remedy this severe underrepresentation of minority owned stations in this field, and indeed not just broadcast stations, but in the whole emerging telecom marketplace, we need to work on creative tax incentives to create incentives for this to happen. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm going to have to depart to another meeting affecting a bill that's very important to my district. So well, I thank you for your courtesy and I thank the chairman for his testimony. Well. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, most federal departments or agencies are required to include a cost-benefit assessment in rulemaking with an economic impact of more than $100 million. The FCC is noteworthy because it does not regularly do so. There is no doubt that many FCC regulations cause consumer and provider impact exceeding $100 million. Why aren't economic studies conducted and published as part of the explanations supporting most agency rulings? Well, actually, we do do this uh, a similar analysis. We comply with the, the Regulatory Flexibility Act, where we, um, and also the Paperwork Reduction Act, where we assess the impact of all of our actions on uh, on small businesses, uh, and um, we do comply with the uh, the Contract with America Act that requires that any of our rulemakings, which have a, an impact, an aggregate impact of, I think, over. Hundred million dollars um, uh, have to be reviewed by Congress, or there at, le at least there's a period for congressional review. Uh, what's the process for reviewing w rules that have been in effect for five years with the Commission? Does the Federal Communications Commission formally review whether the rules are appropriate given the rapid change in consumer and information technology in the marketplace? Well, in some cases, we uh, we commit to reviewing rules after a set period of time. Some of our rules are sunset. Um, I, I, think, I think generally we should do more of that. We should um, uh, either sunset more rules or uh, at least commit to reevaluating them. Now, we have one important tool. Uh, in the 1996 Act, Congress uh, mandated that every two years we review all of our rules involving the common carrier side of, of uh, 
our, uh, our actions. When I became chairman, I expanded that and I, I commenced a, a, a review process of all our rules that we undertake every two years. We're in the process of doing that now. It's called our biennial review. Every two years, we review all our rules. Uh, can you uh, name any major regulation where the FCC's imposed a sunset date? Um, yes, I believe that um, one major rule is the, um, the spectrum cap, which is, I, think, I believe was sunset after five years. We also uh, uh, sunset um, uh, uh, rules, and it's really not a sunset, a, a modification of our rules in the area of uh, set-top box compliance. I'm sure there are more. If, you, if you'd like a more exhaustive list, I'm sure I could provide it. No, I just wanted to get a feel for how often that's utilized. It does uh, help us up here when we have to sunset something and face up to renewing it. Hopefully, we take a look at it, the legislation, and uh, make a more effective document than we did five years before. Uh, I've got two more questions, and if you don't mind, we're going to have a few we'll send to you that you can, at your leisure, and your staff uh, can write it for this point in the records. Of course. So uh, let me just ask my last two. Considering the slow progress that some broadcasters have shown in adopting the spectrum to actual consumer use, did the FCC perform an economic cost-benefit analysis of alternate uses for that spectrum before making the allocation? And when will the FCC review that decision and analyze the public cost-benefit of leaving the allocation as it is? Well, if you're referring to the, um, the digital spectrum, which I, I believe you are, um, this was basically a decision by the U.S. Congress in the 96 Act. Uh, when Congress gave to each commercial broadcaster and non-commercial broadcaster, television licensee, um, an additional six megahertz of spectrum to convert to digital, subject to a requirement that it be um, given back to the government uh, in 2006. Uh, Congress came back in 97 and created um, what is, a, in effect, a loophole in that requirement by saying that broadcasters don't have to return the spectrum until there's a certain level of penetration of digital sets in the, in the marketplace. So this area is pretty much governed by statute, and the FCC doesn't have a whole lot of discretion in this area. When I was uh, heading a large university and we had disaster exercises, let's say in Los Angeles County, where there's 10 million people, 83 cities in it, and uh, there was a real problem in getting communication. Now, there w we had heard there was a lot of uh, the bands in the East Coast, and we didn't have them in the West Coast. Uh, has that problem been solved for... Uh, uh, what kind of uh, emergency vehicles and all need to be able to communicate with the police department? And it looks like everything's just going to be jammed up if you can try to get through. Uh, what's the FCC doing about uh, that? It's still a problem, but uh, we've been making some pretty significant strides. Uh, uh, the most significant thing that we've done is made more spectrum available for public safety uses. Uh, and thanks to the Congress, we were able to uh, reclaim some some spectrum for and and relicense it for public safety uses. We also have uh, established a, an advisory committee, which includes representatives of the various public safety users around the country, to try to come up with ways to more efficiently use the spectrum and ensure that it's interoperable, so that state, federal, and local law enforcement and public safety officials can use it to communicate with one another. So we, we are on top of that issue. Uh, I'm going to throw you a softball for the last question. And uh, this, what do you envision the role of the commission in the 21st century? Well, that's a, uh, that's a hard question, uh, but one that we answered... <laughs> one that we answered in our our strategic plan, which we submitted to the Congress a year ago and that we've, uh, we're continuing to update and work on. Um, essentially, the challenge is to make sure that we are facilitating um, a competitive marketplace. Uh, at the same time, we are protecting c consumers and making sure that the benefits of information technology reach all Americans. And uh, we've made a lot of progress in that regard. There's a lot more work to be done. 
But it's really exciting because uh, we're seeing so much investment pour into these industries and Americans waking up every day to new uses of technology. On your strategic plan, uh, did you uh, sit down with the powers that be in the Commerce Committee to uh, go over it with them? Or did they care? Oh, they, they certainly care. Um, yes, we did, uh, we did talk with a lot of the key members of the Commerce Committee. But in addition, we reached out to all the key stakeholders. We had uh, public roundtables where we brought in groups of academics, and then we brought in consumer advocates and advocates from the disability community and min minority entrepreneurs. And we also reached out to, um, to industry. And it was really a very uh, useful and dynamic process. We even had forums where we had all the FCC employees come together and give us advice on how we should change the agency for the future. And it's very much a living, breathing document that we're working on literally as we speak. Uh, the reason I ask is that this subcommittee has basic jurisdiction on how the processes occur here between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And when a strategic plan is developed or a financial plan is developed, what we'd like to see the political appointees, such as the chair and the commissioners, who have been confirmed by the Senate, deal with the elected uh, employees in the legislative branch. And too often it's just our staff or Commerce's staff and your staff. And uh, I think it would be great if we could get the people that have to go back to the people in one case and who are the wards of the president who's duly elected by all the people. And uh, I just think that we need to get away from simple staff-staff contact, as bright as they all are on both ends of the avenue. But uh, I just would like to see the commissioners sit around the table and sit down and say, hey, do we agree on this is what we ought to be doing under the law? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes silly things, as you know, are in the law, or they're so broad that an agency doesn't know what it's supposed to do. I think it's a very good suggestion. Yeah. Well, uh, I uh, have enjoyed uh, this, and I thank you for coming. And uh, we will send you a few uh, questions. You are still under oath. And uh, thank you very much. And this hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Oh, yeah. Coming up, a preview of the Supreme Court's current...